Hello everybody and welcome to a new reading from Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth of the book Vietnam Why Did We Go? A book that most and for all you would think of course has implications for the American people because it is the soldiers of the American nation that went down there in Southeast Asia and kicked some butt because the Pope called them to. Well, the last thing is something most people do not know that the Pope called them to go down there and quote-unquote kick some butt. And I don't mean that in any kind of diminutory way, but the point is that the role of the Roman Catholic quote-unquote church in wars in general and also in the war of Vietnam is completely underestimated and not understood by many, many people. And, you know, the Pope has control of all the countries in the world who he has a concordat with. For the moment, I think it's about 180 nations the Vatican has a concordat with. And when you have a concordat, that means that this land is uh, using their own civil law, or better said, the Roman Catholic Church is using their Roman Catholic law to influence the civil law of the states. So that means that the states that have a concordat with the Vatican, uh, to say it very clearly, are just vessels of the Vatican. They are just their minions. They do with them whatever they want. And if they don't do what the Catholic Church or the Pope or the Jesuits want them to do, they get trouble. They get either invaded, they get a regime change. All these things, you, you, you I mean, look in history, it, it's, it's so easy. And of course, therefore, this book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go?, most of all interests Americans, but it also interests the rest of the world, because the rest of the world doesn't know of the influence of the Roman Catholic Church either in the military, in, diplom in diplomacy, in uh, quote-unquote politics, all that stuff. Um, it is held out of the news, that's why people don't know it, and not everybody reads a book like this from Avril Manhattan, Vietnam, Why Did We Go?, and that's my motivation to bring this to you. Now, last time I said I'm going to start with Chapter 1, the preliminaries, but I read that already, so I'm not going to repeat myself. I'm going to start right in Chapter 2, and let's go right to the nitty-gritty. Let's go right to the subject that we are talking about here, because it is very important now that we have the history knowledge of what was preceding this war in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century, that we read about in the earlier chapters, 16, 17, 18, the later chapters of the book, but earlier chapters that I read, we are now going into chapter 2, which is called the Vatican-American Grand Alliance. <laughs> with this Grand Alliance, the first thought that comes up with me is the quote-unquote Holy Alliance that I spoke of when reading the book Rulers of Evil. You know, in 1992, there was that um, article from Time magazine about the Holy Alliance, how the Pope and Ronald Reagan conspired to bring down communism against Gorbachev, the quote-unquote Holy Alliance. And if I see, or if I read here the Vatican-American Grand Alliance, I can think of at least a predecessor of exactly that Holy Alliance. Because why does the American nation, which is supposedly to be Protestant, go into an alliance with the Vatican, which is the sea beast of Revelation chapter 13. <laughs> you tell me that can only happen if the people are not aware of Bible prophecy. If the people are not aware that America is not Protestant anymore. Why would that great nation that was founded because people flew, Amer flew Europe from the persecution of the Antichrist in the Middle Ages, why would that nation all of a sudden shake hands with the king they fled from? It doesn't make any sense. And that's something that you should probably keep in the back of your mind all through this reading. So the author starts to say, So far the chronological description of events against French colonial imperialism seemed to be the logical expression of the Vietnamese people to rid themselves of an oppressive and alien domination, which for centuries had attempted to uproot their traditional culture, identity and religion. <laughs> Without reading any further, I can right tell you I want to give a little comment on this. We read 
in the preliminaries about the French oppression, the French imperialism that was pressed upon the Vietnamese and how they wanted to get rid of that. So when it says here of the Vietnamese people to rid themselves of an oppressive and alien domination, well the same goes for the United States of America. The same goes for the country where I come from, Germany, or the country where I live in, Belgium. We are also oppressed by an alien domination. The Pope, the Papacy, the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, the sea beast of Revelation chapter 13. We are oppressed and we are alien, maybe like aliens dominated, uh, dominated by aliens. Aliens mean foreign of our own country. Because our government and the government of the United States of America does not work, does not function for the better of their people, it only functions for the better of the gender of the Vatican. It only functions to get through the agenda of the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. That's it. And very often you see that people just cannot make any sense anymore. Why are we using this and this policy or politics? It doesn't make any sense seeing in history this and this happened and seeing that this is our government. It is not your government. It is the government of the Antichrist and he rules against the people. He does that very subtly because he cannot go out in the open, open all the concentration camp doors and put you all in there. That would be a little bit too obvious. Maybe that time's coming. I don't know. We'll see. But he does it subtly and taking away all the rights that you achieved all through the years, the papacy is taking them back one by one. Because he who gives freedom can take away freedom too. The only real freedom you will ever experience is the freedom you have in the truth in Jesus Christ. And therefore you have to turn to Jesus Christ, of course. So the sentence that Avram Manhattan here writes, so far the chronological description of events against French colonial imperialism, we could say so far the chronological description of events against American uh, suppression by the papacy seem to be the logical expression of the Vietnamese or Uni United States of America people to rid themselves of an oppressive and alien domination. When the Americans wake up, when the Germans wake up, when the Belgians wake up, when the Italian wake up, when the Spanish wake up, when the Brazilian wake up, when the Chinese wake up, and so on and so on and so on, wake up to rid themselves of an oppressive and alien domination which in this case Vietnam for centuries and in the other cases most of the times also for centuries had attempted to uproot their traditional culture identity and religion now let me ask you and let's, let's just um, uh, let's just speak of the United States of America right now what is back of the traditional culture of the United States of America of course you can say, well, we don't have a traditional culture, we are a young nation. Yes, you are a young nation from 1776, you are a young nation from the colonial times from the 16th and 17th century, that is correct, but the quote-unquote traditional culture you have had in that country is what you imported from the countries you came from. And it was most and for all real, true Christianity. That is the identity the United States of America had, and it does not have that anymore today. And also, it was attempted to uproot their traditional religion. Now what is the traditional religion of the United States of America? Protestantism. Protest. That comes from protest. You protest against something. The Protestants protest against the usurpation of the power and the authority of the Antichrist, of the Pope of Rome. When a Protestant doesn't protest anymore, he's not a Protestant anymore. Well, <laughs> easy to understand, right? When you take the protest out of Protestant, you only have an ant. Yeah. But even an ant is, slimmer, is smarter than some people, let me tell you that. 
But the point I want to say is, when you take the protest out of Protestant, you have nothing left anymore. And people don't know why there are Protestants and what to protest, because they are all blinded by the Jesuitical false teaching of Futurism, that the papacy is one single Mr. Bad Guy who appears in the end of time and then everything will go bad. But hey, the church doesn't need to care about that because hey, we are raptured out here. That is not Protestant belief. That is Jesuitical Futurism belief. Real Protestant belief is Historicism. And therefore, you really need to watch the readings I do with Tom Fress on the end time delusion and the ones where we prove in the New Testament that Jesus Christ was the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's 70 years week, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, 2000 years ago. Then you know what you are protesting. The original, quote unquote, traditional identity and religion and culture is taken from the Americans as it was taken here from the Vietnamese. And the Vietnamese didn't want to stand for it. They wanted to fight for it. Uh, now, pure from a biblical Christian way, I don't say that that is correct, but that's on another page. Huh? We should not go there right now and, and speak about that. Huh? Uh, the Vietnamese cannot live biblically because they have never had the gospel in the way that the Americans had the gospel. But if the Americans came there and brought the gospel over there, well, that would have been something, instead of bringing them napalm bombs and uh, machine guns and uh, mines to tread on and uh, all the other warfare machinery they put out there. So this is really a sentence I think we should think some, sometimes about and not only think about the sentence, but also understand that what the author says here about the Vietnamese people, that they wanted to rid themselves of an oppressive and alien domination, that it is something that all nations should do. I mean, that is what the Protestant Reformation was, what the Reformation was in the 16th century. The Reformation rid the people in, Germ in Germany and in Europe of the century-long oppressive and alien domination of the Pope. Very interesting point, right? So let me read the sentence once again and then afterwards, even if you have to pause the video, then you pause the video. But think about this. What is written here about the Vietnamese is in certain terms uh, applicable to more or less all countries in the world. So far, the chronological description of events against French colonial imperialism seemed to be the logical expression of the Vietnamese people to rid themselves of an oppressive and alien domination, which for centuries had attempted to uproot their traditional culture, identity and religion. Now, against French colonial imperialism, when we replace uh, um, French colonial imperialism with papal supremacy imperialism, then you have the meaning of what I'm talking about here the last 15 minutes. The author continues to say, at first sight it seems incomprehensible for the United States of America to get ever more committed to the deadly Vietnamese morass. The tragic American involvement cannot be properly understood unless we take a bird's eye view of the United States of America's global policy following the end of World War II. Only a retrospective assessment of the world which emerged after the defeat of Nazism can spell out the reasons which induced the United States to pursue the, polis the policy which it did. Now here again I have to comment. And if I continue this way this book will take 100, uh, 100 readings I guess but that's not the point. The point is that we have to understand that the author says we have to take a bird's eye view of the United States global policy following the end of World War II, only a retrospective assessment of the world which emerged after the defeat of Nazism. Well, here the author is not correct. 
because Nazism was not defeated. With the Vatican Red Lines and with the Operation Paperclip, many of the Nazis fled Germany and Europe, not only Germany, but Germany, Austria, um, they fled also uh, Croatia and many other countries, Italy, Spain, Portugal probably too, and uh, via the Vatican Red Lines or via most and for all the Nazis from Germany via Operation Paperclip and they were imported into whether Latin America or the United States of America. Reinhard Gehlen, who was a general on the uh, espionage system in Germany, is the founder or co-founder of the CIA with Wild Bill Donovan together that night of Malta. So these Germans, and Reinhard Gehlen is just one example of many, Reinhard Gehlen was imported to further the agenda of the Antichrist. It says here to defeat Nazism, Nazism was never defeated. Because Nazism is nothing else but the policy of the Jesuits. And the Jesuits are not defeated, are they? They are alive and well even today in 2021, aren't they? So Nazism has not, de not been defeated. It is covered up. Yeah, that's what it is. And of course, here and there, few quote-unquote little people, they hung, but the rest, they let go. If you can take a look at the list of all the people that fled Germany and fled into whether Latin America or with Operation Paperclip, United States of America, your eyes will pop out of your head because you won't believe it. Huh? Even this guy Eichmann, who they made later on a process in, um, in Israel, uh, even he was helped to get out of Germany and into Latin America. And Bormann and Werner von Braun. I mean, he was a scientist, right? He helped develop the rockets of the v, uh, V1 and V2 rockets of Germany that flew over England and uh, did a lot of damage over there. Why wasn't he persecuted and... Um, uh, judged in the Nuremberg trials, Werner von Braun and many others, Reinhard Gehlen, one of the, the guys that I say now, and there are many, many more. So, um, a retrospective assessment of the world which emerged after the defeat of Nazism, you can forget that Nazism was defeated, Nazism was replaced. It was replaced somewhere else. And I'm going to tell you something else. When I read the book Behind the Dictators by Leo H. Lehman. It was clear to me because in, uh, in one of the later chapters uh, the author says that the German Kaiser during World War, who was Kaiser during World War I, had a meeting with Pope Leo XIII in the 1890s. 90s. And the Pope said, and that is written down in the uh, memoirs of the uh, means the biography of the uh, of the emperor of the German emperor. The Pope said to the emperor, "We want the Ro we want the Roman Catholic Church wants Germany to be the salt of the Roman Catholic Church all over Europe." And even though the German emperor said, "Well, Pope, <laughs> with all respect, but we don't live in the 1500s, 1600s anymore," the Pope still insisted on that. And what happened then? Germany started, quote unquote, started World War One. Germany, quote unquote, started World War Two. And then, when Germany was defeated and utterly punished for what they did by the same powers that asked them to do that, the sword was taken over to the United States of America. And right after World War Two, they started two very important wars for the Vatican. The Korean War and the Vietnam uh, Vietnamese War, what we are talking about here. Uh, that is so important to understand. This book only makes sense when you include the true history. And when Avril Manhattan says here, a retrospective assessment of the world which emerged after the defeat of Nazism can spell out the reasons which induced the US to pursue the policy which it did? No. Only understanding that the Nazi powers 
merged from Germany to United States of America. When you understand that point, then you can spell out the reasons which induced the United States of America to pursue the policy which it did. Because now, all of a sudden, the United States of America was the salt of the Roman Catholic Church. They took over from the Germans. They quote-unquote wanted to give Europe a rest. But now, the wars come all over the world. Especially now in Far East Asia, with the Vietnamese war to start. So the author says, the policy was inspired by the sudden, awesome realization that the new post-war world was dominated by two mighty giants, the United States and Soviet Russia. And the point is, both quote-unquote mighty giants were made mighty giants by the Roman Catholic Church, by the Jesuits. The Jesuits fomented the October Revolution in 1917 in Russia, when they abolished Tsarism and introduced Communism or Socialism, and the Jesuits introduced Nazism in Germany. And when that was defeated, the Jesuits went over to the United States of America, because they were there from the beginning. Oh yeah! And therefore you just have to understand books like Rulers of Evil and The Ark and the Dove by J. Mars Ives. The United States of America was made that powerful because of the politics of the Jesuits in there. Soviet Russia was that quote-unquote powerful as it at least seemed to be because of the power of the Jesuits. So, the post-war post world was dominated by two mighty giants, the United States and Soviet Russia. Now, the problem is, or quote-unquote problem is, both giants are led by the same puppet master. And the people are being used to play in the agenda of the puppet master, according to the people they come from, whether United States or Russia. Whether they there for socialism or capitalism whether they are there for quote-unquote democracy or socialism. The people are necessary to play the agenda they have no idea of because the puppet player is in the background. Nobody openly tells you that the United States is just a vassal state of the Vatican. Nobody ever tells you that Soviet Russia was an Russia as it is today in 2021 is just a vassal state of the Vatican. Nobody in the quote-unquote mainstream media will ever tell you that, but that's nevertheless, it's a fact. And when you do real history study and real Bible study, you understand that. And then you see this whole war and the whole wars that took part ever since with completely different eyes. And that's what this reading is for. So when the author just says, that the post-war world was dominated by two mighty giants, he fails to tell us that both mighty giants were raised by the same power, the papal, the antichrist power. Both had fought the same enemies in war, but now in peace they faced each other as potential foes. Even this sentence, I have to say, is of course, when you understand it biblically, is not correct. Both, meaning United States and Soviet Russia, had fought the same enemies in war? No. Germany was not a war. America is led by the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy. Russia is led by the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy through the Jesuits. And Germany was run by the Jesuits. So, they are doing a game and we are just standing there looking at it and taking our part because we don't understand what our role actually is. United States and Russia had not fought the same enemies in war. They had furthered the Vatican agenda to persecute the Jews, persecute Protestants, persecute all other kinds of minorities all over the world, also of course the Orthodox Church, 
for example, in Croatia, yeah, in this uh, puppet state of Croatia from Ante Pavelic between 1941 and 1945. I read about that extensively in um, The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmund Paris. Those are the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church. So the Roman Catholic Church takes two, three, four, five, six countries, puts them all in one pot, lets them fight against each other, and out the outcome is that only the pure Tridentine Roman Catholic doctrine survives, and everything else is purged out. Orthodox Catholicism, like in the East, is purged out. The Jews are purged out. The Protestants are purged out. You have only Roman Catholicism in its purest Tridentine form over. That's what these wars are there to achieve. These wars are nothing else but inquisition. Open inquisition. When you even for one second agree with the author here that he says both United States and Soviet Russia, Russia had fought the same enemies, there are no enemies. All the states that were involved in World War II were Jesuit and Roman Catholic Church controlled. It was their theater to persecute certain inhabitants of certain of these countries. I haven't read the book yet, but I should probably go to that one day. That book from Eric John Phelps, Vatican Assassins Wounded in the House of My Friends, because I heard him say on the radio show, so I think that it is legitimate to quote that here, that he said that many of the divisions that were chosen for D-Day to uh, land on the shores in uh, on, on, on uh, Britannia in France in uh, 1944, the sixth of the six months, yeah, six o'clock in the morning, 666, uh, many of the divisions landed there were specially chosen because they contained most and for all Protestant soldiers. Well, they were just sacrificed over there. That's how the Roman Catholic Church works. And only when you understand that, it makes sense to read books like this. And to put again and again out that many of the things written in this book lack a biblical understanding, lack a true historic view, because the author never mentions all involved. He, I guess, quite rarely mentions the Jesuits in this book. Of course, we know that when he speaks about the Foster brothers, uh, the Dulles brothers, sorry, John Foster Dulles and Avery Dulles, we know that they have a Jesuitical background. But that is not so much mentioned with Avro Manhattan, right? So we should always be very um, vigilant when reading books like this. When the author says both the United States and Soviet Russia had fought the same enemies in war, but now in peace they faced each other as potential foes, we know that the whole quote-unquote Cold War was a joke to the people in the know. It was just a theater played to the people in the world, yeah? and that they did not fight enemies in the, uh, in the war that are the enemies let's no let's let's say it this way the enemies they fought in world war ii were not the enemies that they were that that we are told they fought uh, we were told russia and united states of america and england and france and uh, they all fought against germany and the axis of germany in the beginning with italy uh, with japan with turkey and all that no, that's not the point. The point is that these wars are always there to fight Protestantism, to fight any religious opposition to the Roman Catholic Church. Whatever is in opposition to the Roman Catholic Church's dogma and doctrine has to be purged out. That's it. Easy sentence to understand, right? Easy sentence to remember, right? Easy sentence to tell your folks, right? 
Whatever stands in the way of Roman Catholic dogma has to be purged out. That's the enemy. And they will use any nation in any way, shape or form they are pleased to use them the way they want to, to get the real enemies out there. The Jesuits swore in the Jesuit oath that they will annihilate Protestantism from the face of the world. The Roman Catholic Church hates the Bible, the Word of God, and wants to purge the Bible out of this world. And they will use any means necessary, because the end justifies the means, the prerogative of the Jesuit order. Every time when you see some kind of conflict, like the Vietnamese War or anything else, always ask yourself what is the underlying spiritual, probably religious reason behind that. When they wanted to purge Buddhism out of Vietnam? Yeah, because they wanted a government that is as well as a church as a government and that is only with Roman Catholicism. Buddhism doesn't have any political ambitions. It doesn't. No other religion in the world but Roman Catholicism has political ambitions. Because the Roman Catholic Church is a political entity that only behind, uh, hides behind the mantle of religious, uh, religiosity. That's the point. The only point and the valuable and valuable point that we should make on reading this book. So whatever stands in the way of Tridentine ultra-right-wing Roman Catholicism in this world has to be purged out and any means will be used to achieve that goal. The end justifies the means. That's the whole point. That's how we have to understand that. It was a belligerent peace. Communist Russia gave notice from the very beginning, if not by word, at least by deeds, that she was determined to embark upon a program of ideological and territorial expansion. The United States of America was determined to prevent this at all costs. The conflict fought at all levels and simultaneously in Europe, Asia and America became known as the quote-unquote Cold War. A war that is not a war but that was a theater strategy to keep the people busy and to keep the people in fear. Didn't they keep you in fear about the atomic bomb that would explode? Didn't you duck under your desk in school as a school uh, as, as a school going child in, in the 60s and in the 50s in the United States of America? Well, Tom Fress told me that they were taught this duck and dive policy. Fear has to be infested in the people. Because when people have fear, they can be easily controlled. Now, where have you heard that in 2021? Eh? With this corona stuff all over the world? People are in fear. In fear of the virus, in fear of sickness, in fear of losing their jobs, in fear of losing money, in fear of losing their loved ones in fear of this and in fear of that and that's why they are so easily controllable the cold war was a fantastic invented means to control the people of all the world through fear that was the plan and that worked now let's see what Avril Manhattan has to say about this that the quote-unquote cold war was not mere verbal fireworks was proved by the fact that soon the two superpowers were arming at an ever faster rate. Also, that Soviet Russia, following a well-defined expansionistic post-war program, was inching with increasing ruthlessness to the conquest of a great part of Europe. Within a few years, in fact, she had gobbled up almost one-third of the European continent. Countries which had been an integral part of the loose political and economic fabric of pre-war Europe were now forcibly incorporated into the growing Soviet Empire. Speaking for example of Middle Germany, what became the GDR, Eastern Germany, which is today Poland, 
Austria, Hungary, which was split, Austria was kept in the western, but Hungary was kept in the east. The Czech Republic, the Slovak Republic, melted together as Czechoslovakia, yeah? because the Slovaks are Roman Catholics and the Czechs are Protestants. So by merging these two, the power was given to the Roman Catholics. In Germany, we had quote-unquote Eastern Germany that became communist and therefore atheistic and therefore in Middle Germany and Eastern Germany, which became Poland, Protestantism was purged out after the war. And Western Germany, well, they have been dumbed down in a way that they never understand it themselves, but that's what happened. And they gave up their protest because of television, beer and... Uh, Germany seeks a superstar and uh, television programs and things like that. Yeah? Within a few years, in fact, she had gobbled up almost one third of the European continent. So, after the Second World War, almost one third of the European continent became communist. And by communist, I mean atheistic. And that is not Protestant, right? Countries which had been an integral part of the loose political and economic fabric of pre-war Europe were now forcibly incorporated into the growing Soviet Empire. This was done via naked aggression, ideological subversion, concessions and ruthless seizure of power by local communist parties inspired and helped by Moscow. Within less than half a decade, half a decade East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Albania and others had been transformed into Russian colonies or satellite states. If this had been all, it would have been bad enough, uh, a bad enough policy, but Soviet Russia intended to promote a similar program in Asia as well. Her ambitions there were as far-reaching as those in Europe. Indeed, even more so since she intended to convert the Asiatic continent into a gigantic communist landmass. To that effect, she encouraged Asian nationalism combined with Asian communism, see China, exploiting any real or fictitious, fictitious grievances at hand. If we remember that at the same time the sleeping third giant, China, was on the verge of becoming red, means communist, then the rapid communist expansion in the East seen from Washington was a real menace. <laughs> the point is, Washington is Jesuit controlled and China was Jesuit controlled all the time. Hence the necessity of formulating a policy dedicated to the proposition that world communism must be checked both in Europe as well as in Asia. The quote-unquote Cold War, the child of this tremendous ideological struggle, as the tensions between the United States and the Communists increased, threatened to explode into a hot war. And so it came to pass that only five years after the end of World War II, speaking of 1950 then, the United States found herself engaged in the War of Korea, in the opinion of many considered to be the potential prelude of World War III. Reciprocal, reci reciprocal fear, sorry, I butchered that word. Reciprocal fear of atomic incineration restrained both the United States and Soviet Russia from total armed bellige belligerency. The conflict ended in stalemate. Korea was divided. It seemed a solution. The confrontation, for the moment at least, had been avoided. But if it was avoided in Korea, it was not avoided elsewhere. Certainly not in the ideological field or in that of subdued guerrilla warfare since the United States of America had given notice without any more ambiguity that she was determined to stop the Red Expansion wherever communism was threatening to take over. It was at this stage that she started to view the situation in Indochina with growing concern. 
The harassed French had to be helped. Not so much to keep their colonial status quo, but to check the Vietnamese in the South and in the North. The United States of America could not afford to see the French supplanted by communism, disguised as anti-colonialism or even as genuine patriotism. The US strategy was based upon the domino theory. This assumed that, in Asia, once any given country became communist, all the others would become so likewise. Vietnam fitted neatly into this pattern. It became imperative, therefore, that the French should not be defeated by the Vietnamese communists. Whenever I hear this domino um, policy, uh, dom domino theory, I have to think of this movie Dirty Dancing, <laughs> where there is one little political conversation and the uh, domino theory is being mentioned there. Now, the determination of the Vietnamese people to get rid of the French rule, therefore, ran contrary to the United States grand strategy or the strategy of anyone determined to stop the advance of communism in Southeast Asia. And indeed, there was another ready at hand. The Catholic Church had watched the advances of communism in Indochina with a greater concern even than the United States of America. She had more at stake than anyone else, including the French themselves. Almost 400 years of Catholic activities. Seen from Rome, the rapid expansion of, the world, of world communism had become even more terrifying than for Washington. The Vatican had witnessed whole nations, those of Eastern Europe, swallowed up by Soviet Russia with millions of Catholics passing under communist rule. Now, here again I actually have to make a comment to make something very clear. <clears throat> when you read the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehmann, you understand that the persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany by Hitler was nothing else but the purging of the liberal Catholics. And that's what they always do. The Roman Catholic Church even persecutes within her own ranks because she is in her core right tridentine I mean right politically right tridentine authoritative yeah only the authority of the Council of Trent counts the Council of Trent was put in working by the Jesuit order that was just founded five years before that or was ordained just five years before that by Antichrist Pope Paul III founded they were in 1534 but ordained they were 1540 and 1545 through 1563 the Council of Trent took place. The Council of Trent also has the uh, meaning and understanding in many, uh, many people's minds as being the Counter-Reformation Council. Counter-Reformation against the Reformation and only out of the um, not only but uh, out of the um, Council of Trent came a dogma of at least 120 anathemas that were spoken out against Protestants in the time. And that is still valid today. So the policy determined in the Council of Trent is still the policy that makes the Roman Catholic Church move today, even it's almost 500 years later. Nothing has changed. The goals of the Roman Catholic Church have not changed. So, everything that is not ultra right wing, right level, tridentine Catholic has to be purged out of the church. Liberal Catholics are being sacrificed. And they don't care. Well, after the war, what do they do? They make these people sacred. They speak them holy. They sanctify them. They uh, make martyrs out of those then. Oh yeah, these people were this and this and they were martyrs for the Roman Catholic Church when actually they were killed by the Roman Catholic Church itself. You know? That's their policy. So when we read here 
The Vatican had witnessed whole nations, those of Eastern Europe swallowed up by Soviet Russia, with millions of Catholics passing under communist rule, we have to understand that this communist rule is led by the Roman Catholic Church, is led by the Jesuits, with the goal of purging these states of Protestants, Jews, and liberal Catholics. And of course, there is the goal of the Queen of Heaven, the Virgin Mary, as she appears often enough in the Roman Catholic Church, to get Russia back to the Roman Catholic Church. Eastern Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, has eventually to submit to Rome, to the will of Rome. They have to submit to the ultramontane authoritative leadership of the Pope. And whether you convert or you die. This is all things that Avril Manhattan doesn't tell you and these are all things that you need to understand when you really want to understand this book. That's why I'm going so in deep in these comments. I, I probably don't have to do that all through the book but I want to still lay the groundwork in the beginning of the book, chapter 2 we are in, and I want to tell you about these things because it is so important to have this understanding. In addition, the author continues, traditional Catholic countries like Italy and France were harboring growing communist parties. For the Vatican, therefore, it was even more imperative than for the United States to prosecute a policy directed at stopping communism wherever it could be stopped. It became inevitable that the Vatican and the United States should come together to stop the same enemy. The two, having soon formulated a common strategy, turned themselves into veritable partners. The exercise was nothing new to the Vatican. It had a striking precedent as far as how to conduct an alliance with a mighty lay companion to fight the advance of a seemingly irresistible enemy. After World War I, a similar situation developed in Europe. Communism was making rapid advances throughout the West. The existing demo democratic inst uh, institutions seemed impotent to contain it. When, therefore, a forcible right-wing movement appeared on the scene declaring communism as its principal foe, the Vatican allied itself to it, like the Vatican allied itself with Nazism, Adolf Hitler, National Socialism, Fascism in Germany, right? The movement was Fascism. It stopped communism in Italy as well as in Germany with Nazism. The Vatican Fascist Alliance had successfully prevented Soviet Russia from taking over all of Europe. Although it ended in disaster with the outbreak of World War II, nevertheless its original policy of breaking the power of communism had succeeded. The power of communism is from the same people than the other powers come from. So. Um, this means uh, communism is led by the Jesuits as are all the other countries and again the idea is to purge out the enemies of the Roman Catholic Church in between it's like you have two millstones and when you put these two millstones against each other what is being purged in the middle the corn right that's exactly the policy of the Roman Catholic Church. And when you don't understand that the Roman Catholic Church always has control of both sides, then you will never understand the system. Anyway, the author continues to say, now the process had to be repeated, since the situation was the same. The urgency of the task was self-evident everywhere. Soviet Russia had emerged from the Nazi debacle, a more formidable enemy than ever before. Soviet Russia had emerged from the Nazi debacle a more formidable enemy than ever before. It came strengthened out of the war. She was threatening Europe not only with the ideological red virus, interesting choice of word, but also with powerful armies. 
it became a necessity for the Catholic Church, therefore, to forge an alliance with a lay partner, as it did after World War I. The United States was the only military power sufficiently strong to challenge Russian expansions. In Europe, the US-Vatican partnership had proved an undisputed success from the very beginning. Bang! Here you see confirmation of Avro Manhattan confirming what I told you all along. In Europe, the US-Vatican partnership had proved an undisputed success from the very beginning. The prompt creation of political Catholicism on the part of the Vatican, with its launching of Christian democracy on one hand, and the equally prompt economic help of the US to a ruined continent, had stopped a communist takeover. But if the US-Vatican alliance had succeeded in Europe, the problem in Asia was more complicated, more acute and more dangerous. A direct confrontation was possible, meaning a direct confrontation between the US and Russia, Soviet Russia. Not only on political grounds, but also on a military one. This was proved by the fact that the United States had had to fight a true war in Korea, as already mentioned. The lesson of Korea was not easily forgotten. The United States saw to it that the, that the vast unstable surrounding territories did not become the springboard from which another ideological or military attack could be launched to expand communism. When the situation in Vietnam, therefore, started to deteriorate and the military efficiency of the French became too apparent, the two partners which had worked so successfully in Europe came together determined to repeat in Southeast Asia the success of their first anti-communist joint campaign. True, the background and the problems involved were infinitely more complicated than those in Europe. Yet, once a common strategy had been agreed upon, the two could carry it out, each according to its own capabilities. As in the past, each could exert itself where it could be most effective. Thus, whereas the United States could be active in the economic and military fields, the Vatican could do the same in the diplomatic, not to mention in the ecclesiastic area, where it would mobilize millions of Catholics in the pursuance of well-conceived ideological and religious objectives. This brings to an end chapter 2 that was called the Vatican-American Grand Alliance, or a precursor to the Holy Alliance we had in the 1980s. And next time we are going to read into Chapter 3, Fatimization of the West. I already mentioned briefly the Queen of Heaven, the quote-unquote Virgin Mary, which is the Queen of Heaven, which is the Babylonian Semiramis, or Semiramis whatever you want to pronounce that idol on, that Queen of Heaven has had appearances like in Fatima in 1917, at the end of World War I, has had different appearances all over the world, and the overall message of the Virgin Mary is Russia has to subdue the Eastern Orthodox Church has to subdue to Roman Catholicism and every means necessary will be achieved because the Pope demands absolute authority and absolute obedience, cadaver obedience, perende ac cadaver as the Jesuit called it. Called so, whenever there is opposition to that cadaver obedience, that opposition has to be rooted out, rooted out by the roots, plucked up by the roots, because if you leave anything back there, it can spring up.
Well, the word of God was persecuted for the last almost 2,000 years. The word of God actually was persecuted from the beginning of the Garden of Eden. But it always survived. And it will survive. Even if the scale is so little, it will survive until Jesus comes back. And then it will be turned around. And Jesus will rule. And the others will not only be persecuted, but they will be judged. Judgment will come when our Lord comes. Until then we have to deal with all the persecutions, wars, tribulations in this world. And the only thing that we can do is read our Bible, study the Word of God, turn to Jesus Christ, fall on our knees, repent for our sins, and be thankful for the grace that He saved us and with His truth set us free. Because that's the only freedom that counts, the only freedom we will ever experience here in this world. We will go next time into chapter 3, which is called the Fatimization of the West. We will speak of the Queen of Heaven, the Virgin Mary, and how the Roman Catholic Church used her, and still, by the way, uses her today, to achieve her goals. That's why I want to end with asking you to please read your Bible. Until next time. Maranatha.